Welcome to the Be Belt podcast, our local nature-related podcast. Focusing on our three counties, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire, we'll be looking at what can be seen locally on your patch and also on what people can do to help wildlife in your own space. So that's really got to be one of the sounds of spring uh, this time of year. It's the the sound of the first swifts arriving uh, back in back in our towns and across the countryside. Hopefully, it is May Day that we're recording this, which is um, a lovely time of year. Unfortunately, there wasn't any May Day celebrations in Oxford this morning, sadly. Um, so I didn't hear any um, choirs or see any Morris men morrising around anywhere. Uh, <laughs> but Have you seen any Swifts yet, Liz? In fact, Andy, I have indeed. I had my own May Day celebration today. I saw my first Swift in Abingdon yesterday evening. So, yeah, they they have returned on their epic journey. So, um, yeah, really, really lovely to see. How about you, Ed? Have you seen any? I think so. Uh, A couple of days ago, I think I just saw a couple just fly through, but it was when I was out of the corner of my eyes. So um so it wasn't 100 percent, but um yeah ho- hopefully um th- they're back um i say such beautiful and amazing birds so i think yeah today yeah we're gonna start off i think chatting about swifts and why they're such amazing birds and uh, we'll see where the conversation takes us but i think we're gonna sort of try and give you some tips as well uh, uh, about how to encourage birds into your garden as well not just sort of, you know, looking at how you can help swifts but also birds generally so Andy, I mean, yeah, sorry. No, you're right. No, absolutely. Ed. No, thank. Um, yeah, I think it's a great place to start, isn't it, Swifts? I mean, a really kind of uh, iconic bird, aren't they? The, the, some people describe them as, uh, you know, scythes in the sky sort of thing. Mm. And, and that noise we heard at the beginning there, the screaming, it's, it's so iconic, isn't it? If you think of, you know, certainly if you're walking around the streets of um, any town in, in the three counties, you, you'll hopefully be hearing them. Um, and there's, you know, there's, there's some real good reasons to, to look out for them firstly, but also to help protect them. Um, I think there's a 51% uh, decline uh, since the last record um, that between yes. 95 and 2015. So, I mean, if you think of that, that's, that's pretty huge. So. It is. And it's, I mean, it's good, because they are just such amazing birds, aren't they? I mean, because they, the, they are the fastest of all birds in level flight as well I mean, aptly named i mean i think i know per- people i think obviously think peregrines is the fastest but they are but peregrine's speed is you know, where they're harnessing the force of gravity so they're just plummeting down through the air i mean they can reach speeds of what has 189 miles an hour or so the swifts i think have been recorded at 69.3 miles per hour and that's under their own steam so that's in level and even upward flight i mean just uh, and they're really mysterious as well aren't they i mean they just because they spend what is it 10 months of the um the year they're completely airborne and i think the young birds may spend up to three years aloft before coming <laughs> you know returning to rest. and so i mean i don't think we even know how they sleep for example do we no it's it's absolutely incredible isn't it and um this uh, so i mentioned oxford before so oxford is a real kind of um central location for them really in terms of uh, how much they've been studied over time so the oxford university uh, museum of natural history that is a mouthful isn't it uh, the tower there the really famous tower is home to uh, quite a big swift colony that's been studied since the 1940s continuously so there's some great data from that particular area um, and there's a really great project going on at the moment um, called oxford swift city that people can get involved in. Um, I noticed in the last couple of weeks, um, it's an RSPB project and they've posted some online training videos that people can um, get involved in so they can do surveys themselves on their own patch. Um, it's a really great video, so do do check that out on the RSPB website if you want to learn more about Swifts. It's worth noting as well, Andy, that the, um, the webcams, the nest boxes have gone live too there. So um, yeah, asking listeners just to just to check it out and um and see what the swifts are up to they're amazing acrobats aren't they and that's the um that's the iconic sight for me certainly this time of year just seeing them in the in the sky um just flying and dust yeah no, i mean it's amazing and i think one of the reasons they do 
because I think we now we really um, associate them almost totally with our towns and cities. And I think they do really, you know, they, they do much better in towns and cities because I think they fly at higher altitude. I think it's like swallows and house martins. Uh, so they're just less affected by aerial pollution, which means they can sort of thrive in, in, in urban environments as well. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the uh, easy ways to kind of tell them apart from the swallows and the house martins because I think uh, sometimes people do get them muddled up. Um, the, the sound is probably the most distinctive thing, that kind of crazy screaming that they do uh, but also the size of them they're much bigger than the other two and they are usually like ed said much much higher in the sky so mm. they're really feeding on all of those airborne insects up there and you know that's um yeah one of the ways that we can kind of help them in our towns and cities mm. is um, a lot of the work we do is improving uh, nature reserves in in towns and cities to increase the the food sources really uh, but there's also something that people can do in their gardens, so that le and their own spaces, that and that kind of leads us on to what we'll be talking about today, really. So, how can you, uh, you know, see more birds in your space? How can you encourage birds into your space? Um, and why should you? Well, why is that important? So, um, Ed, what 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 do you think? What does you know feeding garden birds mean to you? And do you do you feed them in your garden? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it touches on what we t uh, touched on last week, doesn't it? We looked uh, if you want to, enc you know, um, encourage wildlife into your garden, you need to give it a good reason to stay. And we talked about the, the four main requirements. So food, water, shelter and a place to breed. So it's looking at providing some or all of those elements. So um, with um, with swifts, for example, you know, we'd look at, I mean, one of the, re we talk about the decline of swifts, I mean, for one of the reasons is the fact that the, the nesting sites, they traditionally will nest in sort of up in the eaves and the soft bits of your house, and either through renovation or modern houses don't tend to let, they close those areas off, so swifts have got nowhere to actually nest. Um, so you can look at making nest places for swifts. There's you put nest bricks in, or or you make swift ne nest boxes if you're a even a, a fairly moderate, moderately proficient carpenter. Um, you can build nest boxes. There's lots of uh, information on what you can do. I think that's on the Swift Conservation site. I think it's swift-conservation.org, and they've got a really useful PDF leaflet you can download uh, with tips on 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 swifts. But um, and yeah, again, looking at food sources as well, we talked about the insects uh, um, and that's sort of a natural source of food. So if you're looking at providing food, you want to look at nat providing natural sources as well as artificial sources of food. Liz, do you, do you feed the birds in your own garden? or? I do actually, yeah. Unfortunately, I, I do have a cat, which um, is, is definitely not good for the garden birds. Um, but it does have a bell around its neck, so I'm I'm doing my bit trying to trying to prevent um, any any misbehaviour from that. But yeah, absolutely, um, putting out um, nuts and seeds for for birds, and obviously doing that all year round as well. I think that that's quite important. It's not just in the winter that that mm. birds need it, but certainly um, in the kind of February into March sort of time when there when there is hardly any insects and 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 whatever else that they might um, need um, are about. Feeding birds is is really really important to to keep the uh, populations thriving. I've got a resident blackbird that does tend to come down into the grass and uh, and poke around most mornings, and uh, does like to entertain the cats as well. How about you, Andy? What do you do to attract the birds to your garden? Yeah, no, I I, I definitely feed, and yeah, like you say, I think there's there's been sort of quite a lot of information recently about you know whether you should feed the birds all year round and and certainly yeah the, the general advice is from the bto and rspb that we should be um and it, i think it's just trying to pick the right foods isn't it it's um so at, at this time of year i i haven't I, I did try and do this last year um feeding mealworms to to birds is really important because the the young need high protein food mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, mealworms are a great thing to feed. I did have a go at doing this last year, but I got one of those mealworm feeders and they all just climbed outside. So <laughs> I think I need to try a slightly different, uh, a different way of doing that. Yeah, I think there's a few things to just avoid at this time of year, isn't there? I think things like, uh, sort of peanuts and bread and fat, because I think they can be, um, 
harmful if fed to the nestlings. And I think as well, things like fat balls can go rancid in warm weather. And I think then the fat just coats the bird's feathers. And I think if they're incubating eggs, I think it, the, the fat blocks the, sort of the pores on the eggs and can stop oxygen getting through to the eggs. So there's a couple of things you want to avoid, but no, absolutely feed all year. Definitely. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that, that works really well for me, I, I sort of tried lots of different things. Um, uh, sunflower hearts is, is a great one. I mean, if you, if you want to attract uh, the finches to your garden, um, we're lucky enough to get um, bullfinches, uh, which, yeah, the, not, not as common as they used to be and just an absolutely stunning bird um, mm -hmm. to get in the garden. Mm -hmm. We're really yeah. lucky. Um, but we also starting to get more green finches um, coming through on, on the bird feeders as well, which is great. And that, that really has been all down to feeding sunflower hearts. I mm -hmm. think that, that seems to be a really popular food. So. And is that is that because it's um, high in protein or something, Andy? Is that is that that's obviously what the birds need? Yeah, absolutely. And also, I think it you know it, there's an element there of it um, perhaps being similar to something they would take in in the wild. If if that mm. if there was more seed available, that's probably mm. they would straight away go for the the high protein foods, wouldn't they? So yeah. yeah. Mm. What else can we do? So if um so ne um Ed, I know you were speaking about the um, nest boxes for swifts and things, but presumably you we can um, we can put nest boxes in in gardens for other species as well. I know there's um quite a few designs out there, isn't there, with different size holes in the front for different species? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can put artificial sites up. So um, I think so with the smaller holes so um, I mean the easiest birds to track are things like sort of blue and great tits so and boxes with entry holes about 25 mils in diameter um, are used for like cold tits, marsh tits, blue tits while larger holes of about 28 centimeters will give access to things like trees, sparrows and great tits. I mean you can get open-sided boxes as well which would be used for sort of robins, uh, um, if you're really lucky, things like spotted flycatchers and, and pied wagtails. Um, but there's also natural, um, and oh, I should say as well, I mean, if you want tips as well, if you go onto the BBOT website, uh, www.bbowt.org.uk forward slash actions. Um, there's lots of resources on there how to stay connected with, uh, with nature. Um, but there's also really useful um, sheet on bird boxes and, you know, different designs how to build them where to locate them um, obviously if like Liz you've got a cat um, you want to sort of make sure they're sort of out of pounce di uh, um, distance from a, from a cat uh, and also maintenance as well that's sort of keeping them clean so it's, it's really useful but there's also you know, providing natural spaces for, for um, birds to shelter and nest in as well so um, if I appreciate, you know, everyone's not got a garden of the size to maybe have sort of trees or shrubs, but you, know, you ideally you want a layer um, of different vegetation from tree canopy through to shrubs down to ground cover because different birds will use uh, those different layers and you've got dense shrubs and, and things, ivy up walls. I mean, old ivy, blackbirds and wrens love nesting in, in old ivy as well. So. Mm. Yeah, so both for the food and for the for the shelter, you, you want to think that nat natural and also sort of artificial, a mixture of both. There's a there's a park I walk in every morning with the um with the dog, and um it, it, actually more recently in the last in the last few weeks, walking past there's there's a hedgerow that's obviously been planted in the last five or six years or so. Um, it is absolutely alive with sparrows inside, all chattering away to one another. It is it is brilliant to hear there's um there's obviously a, a wealth of food in there and and probably um lots and lots of nests as well presumably yeah i, th I think that's it's a really lovely thing isn't it if you're out walking around there's there's again there's a hedge on on my street i don't get any sparrows in in my garden at all for some reason i put up one of those little sparrow terraces um but nothing ever lived in it unfortunately but they're all they're all hanging out in the bush down the road so every morning when I walk past him yeah exactly the same thing Liz it's it's really cheery um my friend is lucky enough to have loads of sparrows living right next to him as he's by a playing field and he always says to me they're really annoying uh which I think is a real <laughs> shame but uh, I can imagine if they are right next to you all of the time they might get a little bit 
uh, a little bit loud. Um, Perhaps around five o'clock in the morning about <laughs> about this time of year might be a little bit annoying. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that that's a nice link, Liz, because um, oh, we, <laughs> we were going to talk about the uh, this weekend. So it is, it is the 1st of May today. So, yeah, happy May Day to everyone again. Uh, but on Sunday, it's actually International Dawn Chorus Day. So this will be released after that's happened. But it really is just a celebration of the fact that at that, if you if you get up early in the morning, uh, me and Ed were talking about this earlier, and we were just saying, actually, just leave your window open, and you don't need to set your alarm at this time of year because <laughs> you will be awakened by this incredible symphony of of birds singing. Um, so, although it it will have passed dawn chorus day because it is Sunday. Um, this time of year really is the best time to listen to the Don Chorus. So I you know, well, would definitely recommend doing that if you get the chance. Yeah, all the way through until June. May and June, it's when all the birds, yeah, the Dawn Chorus is, is really at its peak. So, yeah, and absolutely one of nature's greatest spectacles. If that's the correct phrase for a, a kind of <laughs> <laughs> audio experience yeah. rather than the visual one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I think... you. you You've also got a fairly good chance of seeing things as well if you do manage to get out to the park or um, uh, or, or if you're lucky enough to have a garden, just stand out there and watch them all uh, moving around. I mean, so many of the birds are, are looking for the highest point to kind of shout at everything else, aren't they, to say, this is my territory. So um, it's <laughs> they're all just screaming at each other. Like I've said screaming so many times today, I didn't mean to say that. Uh, shouting at each other and, you know, claiming their territory. So there's some lovely... Um, sounds to listen out for as well I mean I think my favourite this time of year is probably black caps um, just slightly uh, underrated because the the nightingale kind of um, has a nicer song but they do call the black cap the I think the March nightingale because it's usually mm. one of the earlier ones to sing but lovely lovely sound lovely birds as well and I think with the dawn chorus as well the birds all tend to join in in a regular sequence as well so if you get up early enough I think I think I read somewhere that it's about 47 minutes before dawn, I think, is meant to be the optimal time. Um, so that is quite early in the morning. But yeah, birds, they'll, birds will start, start singing in sequence. I think like things like skylarks and song thrushes and robins start, finish, start first. And then later on, things like wrens and the warblers, like the black caps, will join in a little later. Lovely, yeah. And it's, it's also uh, another one of these things that um, it's a nice opportunity to learn. You know, if we are spending more time in our local spaces, um, take a bit of time out and, and just try and learn some of the bird songs. It's a, another way of being able to identify them without actually seeing them. Um, I, I would recommend definitely not trying to learn too many at once. That, that would be the advice I would give because it can be a little bit overwhelming, but you can pick a few. Um, definitely don't start with warblers. <laughs> no, start with some of the more common species, like you'll hear a lot of things like, you know, and then you can almost start to eliminate them because your things like robin, you know, blue tits and great tits, which can be a bit more challenging than you think sometimes because they're really, especially great, it's really good mimics as well. So they mimic other birds. But yeah, I mean, they've got quite distinctive calls. So yeah, do the common ones first and then you can let's say then start to build up your repertoire. Mm. My like rain is a, a good one to learn. Sorry, Liz. No, I was, I was good. No, it's, it's great advice. I was just going to say that there's a there's an app, isn't there? I know the RSPB definitely has an app that with um with birds with bird song, and you can you can play that just to kind of get your ear in, and then um yeah, go out go out and see if you see if you can pick a wren out of the of the crowd. It's a yeah, it's an amazing opportunity to go and to go and learn something new. Definitely. There's, there's loads of really great online resources as well for, for learning bird calls. Um, certainly the British Trust for Ornithology and the RSPB have some great resources on their webpage and also quite good comparisons as well, because some of the, some of the like Ed said, some of the songs are, are not that easy to learn, and, um, but it will tell you which ones are similar. So you can kind of focus in on particular aspects of a call and, and learn them that way. So yeah, I mean, a lovely thing to do and, and definitely something that, um, you know, try and get the family out and do it as well. You know, like if you've mm. got kids, um, they're probably going to be awake anyway. Um, so <laughs> you, you may as well, uh, you know, go out, go out in the garden with them or go down to the park and, and just have a listen and, and see what you can hear. It's a lovely thing to do. 
especially now i guess isn't it when um during during this kind of lockdown period when there's when there's no planes in the sky there's no traffic i i can't hear the hum of the a34 in my garden anymore um so absolutely it's it's, it's such a great time to get outside and and, and hear the birds yeah, just to talk about sparrows as well, just a, like a traffic around. I, was, um, I never get them like you, Andy. I just don't see them in the back garden at all. But the other night I was looking out of my front window and there were just loads in, just in the front garden. They're all um, bathing in the dust um, just, oh, yeah. uh, in, in the front garden. And there must have been about 30 of them all. And, and they were all in the road. They were all like foraging in the, in the gutter. The road. I was watching that 10 minutes because there's no traffic. It was like they own the street, you know. Yeah. <laughs> really lovely little birds yeah yeah it's amazing isn't it like um, a lot of people have been saying about wildlife being in places where it wouldn't normally be and uh someone was asked saying to me the other day they'd seen some ducks at the petrol station um you know and i, I just thought you know that's nice isn't it the 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 drake had taken the the chicks out for a little tour of the site mm. uh, and i was just, <laughs> just got me thinking the local hot spots yeah exactly that's a bit of an odd 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 thing to bring up i just thought it was quite funny no it's nice Bird, birds are really really quirky aren't they they're they're lovely and i i think it's probably fair to say that um everyone's probably got their favorite species i am definitely all over the sparrows in the garden because they are so quirky love them yeah i think i think sparrows are, are, are such a good one aren't they and and they they've got that lovely little um simple call as well that's very easy to remember uh, it sounds like sweet sweets, doesn't it? They just constantly say that uh, as if uh, there's a child asking for some sweets from its parents or something. Um, <laughs> it's quite a nice little, uh, a nice little song that they have. Um, but yeah, they're just so jolly, aren't they? And they're they're and they're, they're hang- so, and they're so adaptable, aren't they? I mean, they're just such associated with with people as well. And I was reading the other day about where they've been recorded nesting. I think the sparrows have been recorded nesting on the 80th floor of the Empire State Building. <laughs> and uh, and back in back in the 1970s, apparently there were some uh, who actually sort of lived for a couple of years, 2,000 feet below ground at a coal mine in South Yorkshire, just living off the scraps that the uh, the mines fed them. So they're really adaptable little birds. Uh, it's great, isn't it? And, and yeah, I guess similar to robins, really. Where they're sort of part of our culture, aren't they? They're, they're so kind of they sort of represent our that they are the favourite birds of of most people. Um, I think the the RSPB Garden Bird Watch this year um, had the sparrow as the the number one spotted bird again. Uh, so which is which is great but i mean they're, they're still in huge amounts of decline aren't they due to habitat loss elsewhere and and again it's it is it's our space and the, the places and the towns and the um and the villages that are, that are really the strongholds for them now like you say they're, yeah. they're hugely adaptable because they were the, i think everyone probably thinks of sparrow as the most common british bird but it's not i mean it used to be i think when um yeah, when i was born you know, back in sort of the, the late sixties, the sparrows were the um, most populous British bird. I think about twenty-five million breeding pairs in nineteen seventy, whereas now that's down to about five million. The wren is actually the um, commonest British bird. Is it okay. these days? Yeah, wow. um, I think there's almost twice as many wrens as the second most uh, the commonest British bird, which I think is the robin. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, they're really struggling. So the fact, even though it keeps coming up at the top of the British Garden Birdwatch, um, that really hides, you know, again, a really calamitous decline in, in numbers. Mm. Um, I think it's what, about mm. sort of 60 something, well, well over 60%, I think, since 1970. And that's even higher, I think, in some areas, isn't it? Like London, it's like close to 90% in some areas. Mm. And I think don't really know what's causing it. I think there's been lots of things sort of proposed whether it's unleaded petrol or diesel particulates or use of garden pesticides or I think the latest thing I read this year was, it was some kind of avian malaria or something that was uh, um, causing oh the decline but um, don't know why it affects just sparrows and not other species. It does just goes to show doesn't it how important it is to to do our bit in our own spaces whether that's in our gardens or, or local parks or or the projects perhaps that um that that we work on within the wildlife trusts mm. just to um just to ensure that all that habitat um can be connected in some way so so our so our feathered friends can um can carry on 
um, you know, doing their thing and, and, and finding their habitat and basically surviving, really. It just goes to show how important just doing our thing really is. Definitely. And yeah, just even the, the supplementary feeding as well in, in, in your garden or in your own space. I mean, we do have some, we've got some nature reserves in, in Oxford where some of the volunteers have sort of taken it on themselves to set up feeding stations. Uh, so if anybody's near to, to Rally Park, there, there's a group of volunteers there who've set up a feeding station and um, it's really lovely actually. It's, it's, you know, it's a nice community initiative and um, you can go and watch watch them in the park if you haven't got your own garden. So it's a nice thing to do. But yeah, it's really important to feed them. Um, food is 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 scarce for birds, unfortunately. Now there's not as much as there was. Um, but yeah, the, we can really help, can't we? By mm. by supplementing mm. that 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 food, and mm. and you also get the joy of getting them in your garden. I mean, that's ultimately why we do it, isn't it? It's it's quite a it's a selfish thing, really, feeding the birds because. You know, every morning when I get up, I'm lucky enough to, you know, I can make a cup of tea and I can stare out the window for too long uh, <laughs> and just lose myself <laughs> in the in the bird world. <laughs> it's just really fun just watching the dynamics of the different species, isn't it? Yeah. How they all interact with each other and how some are more timid than others. And yeah, but just, yeah, it's just a real magical uplift of spirits, I think. I'm just glad that we get to share our space with them. Yeah, absolutely. I guess it's also worth pointing out that we should also remember um, food is one thing, but um, birds also need water, I guess. So um, it's important to um, to ensure that we've got some water in the garden. Yeah, even if it's just a, a small, like shallow bowl, because it's for bathing as well, isn't it? As much for, for, for drinking as a blackbird having a having a bath in my little pond yesterday. I don't know why it was actually pouring with rain. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he spent ages trying to dry was, himself up after that. He was time. having an indulgent spa, yeah, rather than, <laughs> rather than just yeah. a shower, uh, a deep clean. Yeah. yeah, and even if you don't have much space, it's like a small bowl, or you can put feeders up in your window as well. You know, you've got the little window feeders or a window box um, for start. You know, that, that can encourage birds in as well. Definitely. Yeah, those little window feeders are brilliant. Um, I know the guys at our office in Littlemore have one. Um, on their window um, and yeah it gets used really frequently actually I think the birds get quite used to seeing these big faces through the window and they don't they're not scared anymore um, so yeah it seems to work well so yeah if you don't have as much space for, for a, a feeder yeah stick stick one on your on a, on a window and they're good as well absolutely absolutely i'm um, i know that we've got one next to next to my um next to my desk a little more and i just wonder whether that's my big face you're you're, you're talking about <laughs> Andy, but we'll come back to that later <laughs> uh i i did not know that you had one <laughs> uh, <laughs> so okay. i guess that's a good time to leave it there then <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely uh, yeah that's, so they, Sorry, Ed, go on. You were... I was saying, get here, head out and uh, scan the skies and see if uh, any of the Swifts have arrived in the, in Chelsea yet. Definitely. I'm definitely going to be listening out for them this weekend and, um, yeah, hoping, hoping to, to hear some. And I'll definitely be out on Sunday morning, will I? I'll, let, I'll see, see how that goes. I might be lying in bed <laughs> listening to the birds out of the window. <laughs> I am definitely going to be do, be do, using that tact. Absolutely, the window will be open, and I'll be hearing it from the comfort of my of my bed. <laughs> <laughs> Good choice. Well, thanks everyone for listening, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll see you or hear you or you'll hear us next time. Um, but thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Ed and Liz as well. No, thank you. Good to catch up. We'll speak soon. Cheers, everyone. You have been listening to the Be Bout podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. For more information about your local wildlife trust and how to join us, please visit www.bbowt.org.uk.